Okay, so tonight's session is by Guillaume Potard, uh, and I'll outline his background, because you'd be too modest to do it yourself. Yes, yes, good. Um, machine listening when artificial intelligence meets audio. Okay, now Guillaume obtained a PhD entitled 3D Audio Object Oriented Coding from the University of Wollongong in New South Wales. Uh, he came from an electrical and telecommunications engineering background, but had a, long, a lifelong passion for sound, music, digital audio, and more recently, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So tonight we're going to find out all about that. Within 15 year, with 15 years of professional experience, Guillaume worked as a senior DSP engineer at Dolby in Sydney, then founded Lofty Consulting in 2011. Some of the company Lofty's achievements include developing algorithms for the bionic ear, improving Dolby Atmos, well done, and uh, creating new technology for multi-million dollar medical device projects. The study of neural networks and artificial intelligence has been around for several decades, but has had a renaissance since the 2000s when the buzzword deep learning was coined. Guillaume will review what deep learning is and give an overview of the concepts and building blocks behind the more general umbrella terms machine learning and artificial intelligence. He'll then focus on how machine learning is used today in conjunction with speech and audio and, and in products such as personal voice assistance, hearing aids, fault monitoring and probably cars. Yeah, I thought so. A practical overview will then follow the tools database is currently available for developing and training. Gam will present some of his own work which aims at improving the perception and understanding of sound by machines and is inspired by the fascinating processes happening in the human auditory cortex. A real mystery box. Okay, so I'd like you to welcome Guillaume tonight, and I reckon it'll be a very informative session. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, great introduction. So, um, who has some uh, concepts or has worked with machine learning in the past? A few? Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, this talk is about giving a general introduction uh, in layman's terms. And uh, so we'll discuss what's, uh, you heard this term deep learning, so what is it? Uh, so first we've got to talk about shallow learning. Uh, then we'll talk about how we can uh, apply some of these concepts for audio, uh, synthesis and listening, so machine listening. Uh, then we'll discuss about what uh, a project we've got going on internally on, about that. And then we'll talk about some of the tools and uh, hardware that uh, are pretty exciting and uh, in coming very soon. Right, so this is kind of a Venn diagram of uh, where artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, fit in. So uh, AI is the big, is uh, the big picture, and then within that you got machine learning, and within that you got deep learning and shallow learning. So what is uh, what is AI? So definition is uh, is uh, I mean you got different grades. So right now we is, we are at, uh, narrow intelligence, so weak AI, which means uh, it specializes well only in one thing, so like playing chess or playing Go much better than a human can, but if you ask it to drive a car, it's hopeless, right? It's a, you it won't switch context. Uh, so really what's the holy grail about AI is the, what they call the um, artificial general intelligence. And that's when it's as smart as human across the board. So it can reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, uh, comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly, uh, from experience, and uh, I've had it uh, creativity, and creativity and art. Uh, whether we'll get there one day, I don't know. It's quite an uh, open question. But if we are, if we get there, then because you can uh, teach an AI to create more AI, then it's a feedback loop, and uh, 
when you open that Pandora's box, then that's, uh, uh, you get something called uh, artificial superintelligence, which is, uh, could be science fiction or could be real one day. But uh, if you think of something that is million, one million times more intelligent than a human, it's quite, uh, it's hard to comprehend. Uh, so they call it that event, the singularity. Uh, just to put things into context, because uh, we're not there yet, the human brain, uh, some people have made um, an estimation of how many operations per second the brain would take if you are turning the brain into a computer. And also it's not a very exact <laughs> number, but they came up with uh, 1,000 petaflops. Uh, and one petaflop is 1,000 trillion uh, operations per second. Um, and the, 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 the most powerful supercomputer in China right now, uh, the Tanin 2, is at 32 petaflops. And so the brain runs at 200 hertz max on the, the, the neurons, uses 20 watts of power, and uh, that supercomputer, you need a, a nuclear power power station to run it, so. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's getting there slowly. <laughs> um, so this gives the kind of a history. Um, so it started with uh, Alan Turing, you know, the famous uh, mathematician uh, that came up with the Turing test. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with the Turing test? Yeah. So it basically it's, uh, if you're chatting with a, uh, if you're chatting with a chat keyboard system to a, a computer and you think the person is a human, then uh, the the machine has passed the Turing test. Um, so from the 80s to 2010, there was a lot of uh, uh, there was some work in laying out the groundwork for uh, some of the algorithms uh, for machine learning. And neural networks have been around for a long time, since the uh, 50s, but uh, because of computing power, uh, it, it, it went through a long winter uh, until around 2010, where uh, first there were some breakthroughs in the theories where uh, they could train the networks. and the computers were more, much more powerful. And I think also because um, before it kind of stayed uh, quite academic, and now you've got big companies like Google uh, pumping um, millions of dollars and massive resources into it. So that's really boosting the whole, uh, the whole uh, um, area. Um, so, What's, uh, when do you need to use machine learning? So um, say if you want to, so the, f what the first approach is a rule-based system. So you just tell the, program, the computer exactly what it needs to be doing. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work well because uh, the rules are too complex or there's too many uh, dimensions, too much data. Um, so if you have to, for example, create a classifier that separates these two, uh, two classes, then you, you could say the, to the computer, okay, draw a line here, and everything on that side of the, the line is this, the blue dots, and <coughs> any side of, anything that comes on that side of the, of the line is an orange dot. Okay, that works well, but if you got some data like that, okay, it's becoming a bit harder, you gotta find out the equation of that uh, spiral, but you can still do it. But if you gotta recognize like handwritten digits, uh, these are only like 25 pixels by 25 pixels. Uh, if you were to make a computer program with just uh, if statements, if that pixel is white and that pixel is black, then it's uh, uh, number three. That would be very, very hard to, to do well. So uh, almost impossible really. So what you, that's when the need for machine learning comes in. Uh, so you make a flexible system and you give it lots of data and the machine uh, learns automatically from, um, from the data. And then, um, then when you've got new data coming in, the, the machine uh, recognizes the data uh, from, its, uh, from the training. 
So right now it's used uh, everywhere, and I think it's going to keep increasing. Um, like in fraud detection, uh, banks, uh, ATO, if you do a big GST return, which is a bit dodgy, then it will flag some, some uh, raise some flags. Uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, image recognition, uh, sentiment analysis, so you can give a machine a, a text or an article and it can say whether it's positive or what's the general emotion about that article. Um, uh, spam detection, uh, very useful. Recommendation systems, like Netflix, you like that movie, so you must like this movie. Uh, even medical diagnosis, now uh, machines are getting better at uh, detecting cancer tumors on from a, like a slide uh, better than a, a trained uh, uh, doctor can do it. Uh, Facebook, Google wouldn't exist without uh, they all really in the end uh, AI and machine learning uh, companies uh, etc. Uh, robotics, self-driving cars, it, it's endless. <coughs> Right, so we're going to talk about some of the, use some really simple algorithms to give you a handle on what it is, really. Um, so in machine learning, there's three kind of um, general families of, of algorithms. One is supervised learning, where you give labels to the data. Uh, so like in previous example, we said this is a, an orange dot, this is a blue dot, um, and so the computer can discriminate between the, the data because it's got that label. Um, one, uh, so you got classification uh, and regression, I'll go, go into that. The other kind is unsupervised learning, is you give the computer some data without no labels and uh, it has to uh, make some clusters or find some correlation within the data. So it's got different usage. Sometimes you don't have labels, uh, you just got data. Uh, reinforcement learning is pretty exciting. It's like, uh, um, kind of, this is where, where the AI is really hot right now is in reinforcement learning. It's, uh, you got agents that can react to uh, environment and then uh, adapt to their environments. I'll, I'll give some examples. Right, so in supervised learning, you got regression and classification. So regression really is to uh, someone gives you this data, so this the the red crosses, and it's the price of a house in function of the, the square footage of the house. Uh, and um, in this case, it's linear regression. It's finding what's the optimal uh, kind of a, uh, line that is the closest to all of the data points. So if someone gives you, okay, what's, uh, so then I've got a new house. It's 500 uh, square feet. What's, what's my price? Then you'll be able to predict any kind of price. So this is a simple example, but you can have a uh, number of windows uh, how far is it from CBD? Uh, many, uh, so these are called dimensions or features, and becomes more, becomes more complex. After after two, you cannot plot it anymore. It becomes uh, abstract. But the computer doesn't care about any, uh, how many dimensions. <coughs> so here's a little example. If I give you these numbers, like X and Y, and you're going to find what's the uh, function, what's the relationship between uh, these numbers? I should give you five seconds. <laughs> right, so the solution is simply uh, <coughs> x, uh, h of x is uh, minus one plus two x, right? And so what you've just did is actually machine learning in your brain, right? You've just uh, gave you some data, and you came up with some parameters, which are minus one and two. So really all machine learning usually is, is you give some data, and you have to come up with these, par these two parameters. 
Obviously, there can be more parameters, so there can be more features. So up to hundred thousands of features. Uh, and ob obviously, you don't do this by hand. So you train the computer to find these numbers for you. So then, if you got new data, uh, you be able to predict what's the the value is. Um, so this is what we did, right? We took some training, training data. We got a learning algorithm, and this is the hypothesis function. Um, basically, it's just the mapping between the input and the output. And if you want to find what are the sort of theta parameters are your uh, <coughs> the minus one and the two, these are the par the parameters of the model. Uh, if you do machine learning, you'll hear a lot about cost functions. And cost function is basically just uh, what's the error between uh, your prediction and uh, the, re the training data. Uh, so for example here, you see the fit is, is, is pretty bad <coughs> because the distance between the points and the, the average distance between the points and the, the line is uh, it's quite big. Uh, so this plots the, uh, the loss function in function of the, this, the, the theta 0 and theta 1. So theta 0 is just the, the offset, and theta 1 is just the slope of the, of the curve, of the line. Um, whereas if you got a good fit, then you're in the middle here. Um, so there's an algorithm that uh, finds that minimal error, and when you get at a minimal error, it means you get the best fit possible for your data. Uh, so this algorithm is called gradient descent, and it's used, uh, it's the kind of the, one of the main algorithms uh, in neural networks as well for training very complex systems. It's still using the, the same prin principle, and really all it does is uh, if you get your Lost your uh, cost function. You want to find that minimal, the lowest point, which gives you the best best fit. And it's like if you're in a mountain, and at each point you you're <coughs> looking for the steepest steep, uh, steepest slope. And at each point you uh, recheck. And if you keep doing that uh, iteratively, <coughs> you'll eventually find a minimal point. Uh, and there's a, this parameter is called a learning uh, parameter. It's just the step size. So if it's too small, you'll, you'll get there, but it takes a long time. If it's too big, you'll be ju jumping all around the place, and you'll never find that minimal point. So it's a, that, this is a tuning parameter. It's a, you've got to choose wisely um, that parameter when you train your model. Um, Can I just ask a question about that previous diagram? Sure. It, just looking at the diagram, it looks as if you're teasing us with a completely different thought again, and that is that the other valley, the, the one off the yes. right, could well be uh, that's right uh, deeper. In which case, you haven't found the minimum at all. Yeah, this is all called a local minimum. So you, it's possible that you're stuck in a local minimum. So if you start, we started here, but if you start here, you might end up here instead. And that's a fact of uh, of life. It is. Um, there's different ways to go. Some, some is to start, do the gradient distance many times, so you try many different points, and you take, uh, just make sure you're really at the, at the bottom. Yeah. So this can be, of course, multi-dimensional. Uh, here, there's only two dimensions, but yeah. Just a question on the gradient parameter. Yeah. Uh, is it possible for the machine to determine that mm -hmm. optimal parameter by itself rather than be you know, talked to the machine? So that learning yeah, parameter. The one, yeah. Yeah. Is There's it possible for the machine to say, okay, I've done small steps for a while. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm going to vary that. That's is, right. Yeah. Is that is that the way that exists? Yeah. That exists, so they exactly. adaptively. Usually they start with a big step. And then, as the error goes slower, you you slower your, okay. your step size. So this is adapti adaptive. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, even if you find the best uh, minimum point, it might not be actually a good thing. 
uh, and this is called overfitting. And uh, it's because you don't want to um, see if someone gives you that data, and you got a, instead of having a linear regression, you got polynomial re regression, which means uh, you just got this square and cube. Uh, so it allows you to draw like a wiggly curves. Um, you don't want the, your system to be so perfect that it's trying to go all around the, all the, the points because it just wouldn't be uh, correct if someone gives you a new point. Uh, this is very important. I'll talk with the, in the context of neural network, but overfitting is, uh, is something you want to avoid. So, and this is it's called the bias variance uh, trade-off. Uh, if you got a high bias, your system is too simple, so that equation is too simple, and you got a, your fit is not uh, is not good enough. Here it's just right, so you're not trying to get through all the points, but uh, it's still a, a, a good model. And on the right, it's too much variance. It means you're overfitting. You're trying too hard. <coughs> Right, so classification is, uh, instead of finding that optimal uh, line between all the points, you create a line that separates the, uh, uh, the data, so the labels. So if someone gives you a new point, uh, say here, then you say, okay, well, because it's on that side of the line, most likely it's gonna be orange, uh, an orange dot as well, right? Um, you can get all sorts of um, uh, decision boundaries. <coughs> so if you're trying to do audio of classification, you don't have uh, um, this, you know, right here, you got these kind of two dimensions, two features. But uh, in audio, you just got audio, right? You got to go, uh, um, just the audio samples. So if you want to do classification, you first have to do feature extraction. Uh, and feature extraction is uh, it's called feature engineering. And it can be anything that can be used to discriminate what you're trying to discriminate. Right. So if you're trying to discriminate uh, classical music from uh, heavy metal, then you'll find uh, features that are maybe pick up more um, guitar or distortion. Uh, things like that, um, and this takes a long time actually. To if you're doing a audio classifier, this most of the time is spent uh, designing good features. The classifier algorithm kind of is almost uh, uh, comes seconds, but it's the hard part is doing good feature extraction. And we'll see it then. That's because it's shallow learning, and. Uh, you see that in deep learning, they try to avoid that by not doing any feature extraction. You, you, do the, you let the system find the, its own features. Um, so some classification algorithms. Uh, a simple one is the, uh, the K, uh, uh, nearest neighbors. It's very simple. Uh, so someone gives you a new, a new point here and oh, without any Labels, you've got to figure out what, okay, what is this point? So, is it, uh, you know, is it classical music or heavy metal? Um, if it's, you just count, I mean, uh, neighbors, they are around your point. And if it's, there's more of one class, then most likely it's going to be uh, that class. So, it's going to be, uh, say, let's say it's classical music. Uh, then you got decision trees and random forests. Uh, so Decision trees are very simple. It's um, at each uh, node you do a, you test a feature. So is that feature uh, greater than a certain number? Yes, you go there, or no, you go there, etc. You could have big decision trees. Uh, of course, these are uh, trained uh, automatically by a machine, so it will give you a, um, that tree. What's nice about trees is they are human readable, so you can uh, see what the algorithm is doing. Uh, random forest is you take um, many trees 
and you train them on, on random parts of the data, and then you combine all these uh, random, uh, all these trees into a, a, a one solution. And it gives you, um, it's pretty good. It's one of the strongest uh, classifier, actually. Uh, another one which is heavily used is the logistic regression. And it's really just plugging in uh, the linear regression that we saw before into this uh, function, which is the sigma function. And there's nothing special about the function. It's just, uh, it just goes from 0 to 1. Um, and that 0 to 1 is actually a prob probability. And you train your gradient descent to uh, maximize the, uh, the likelihood of the, of the class. And uh, so the cost function is a bit different. but. Uh, so actually, we'll see that this is actually a neuron, and this is the building block of, of uh, neural networks. <coughs> right, so the way you test, uh, you usually you, you go to some data, and then you uh, split it into training, and then you keep away, uh, say, one-tenth of the data, and you test uh, your, your algorithm with that. And then you'll do that again with a different set. You train, and then uh, and then you average all the results. And uh, it's called k-fold validation. And uh, it's a good way of making sure um, you, uh, to measure the performance of your of your algorithm. Because remember that when you test on that data, it's never seen that data before. It's using the it's using the training data, but the testing data it's new data. And in the real world, when you're testing something, that's it's always new data, right? You've got no labels. That's that's the job is to classify. So, the, as I said, the, you train your system to be uh, to avoid overfitting or underfitting, and you've got to find uh, the right balance between the amount of training data you got, the complexity of your system, and your number of features. So, uh, this is quite a bit of art and bit of a science. Uh, you got to find the right balance between all these to make it work. Uh, this just shows the different classifier algorithms. How they uh, these are called decision boundaries. Um, so some work better than others. So it's really there's a lot of many parameters you can play with when you're designing uh, machine learning. Like there's a um, yeah, there's many algorithms you can, so some will work better than others, and uh, it can take a bit of time to go through each of them. <coughs> um, now, unsupervised learning is, you just got this, you got some data, uh, and you want to separate, say you say you want to create three groups, and this uh, the k-means clustering is uh, quite simple. It's, it's, it uh, it say give me three groups of data, and it, it will find these uh, centroids for you, and then it kind of creates. Okay, this is uh, classical music. This is uh, heavy metal. This is uh, ambient music. It will uh, separate your data for you automatically. Uh, it's also used a lot in uh, marketing for detecting different groups of uh, behaviors of users. Uh, and reinforcement learning is the third type of, uh, uh, of shallow learning. And uh, it's, um, it's quite different. And I actually don't know much about it, but I'll, I'll tell you what I know about it. Uh, is um, <coughs> The so you got this agent, and uh, that can act on an environment, and there's a and then the environment um, kind of feedbacks on back on the agent, and the the aim is to maximize the uh, reward. So they use it a lot for uh, video games, uh, for testing video games. Um, so the reward is just the score of the game. Uh, so actually, uh, the 
for example, this is an example. So that mouse has to look around, uh, and when it gets zapped, it's a, say a minus one score. And if it gets water, it's plus one. But if it gets the cheese, it's uh, plus ten. Um, and it will uh, randomly kind of explore uh, different uh, chambers. Uh, one of the key concepts is that uh, exploration and exploitation trade-off is uh, they got this uh, thing called uh, it's called a reward uh, future future reward, and uh, because if you didn't have that, it would draw, for example, it will go to the the water and just stops there because it, it keeps doing that. But uh, you can train the algorithm to uh, kind of uh, uh, wait until you get the, the bigger reward. So it's a, a, a kind of tuning parameter in the, in the system. So you can explore or uh, exploit uh, directly. So an example is the um, the Atari. Uh, the old, old game consoles, and uh, all they give to the system is just the pixels of the game, and uh, all the what the agent can do is just move the uh, the, car the character. So this is a space invader, and the game doesn't know that what it is, or uh, it has to figure everything out. Like, okay, if I'm doing this, I'm going left, and through uh, like millions of simulations. It uh, by ma maximi maximizing that reward, it will find the best uh, strategies automatically, and uh, that's AlphaGo. I don't know if you uh, in 2016, that's they played uh, Google. They competed against a professional Go player, and they beat beat him, and that's it's based on reinforcement learning uh, their approach. Right, so deep learning. Um, so we just saw one neuron is just you just uh, adding stuff together with a, uh, these are called weights. So x1 uh, times theta1, and then you add everything together, and then you feed that into your this is called an activation function. And this is just really one neuron. And uh, for a long time, people. Um, didn't believe uh, in neural networks because they, they couldn't figure out the uh, ex exclusive or uh, function, which is uh, if you know logic, but if it's uh, if you got one uh, zero or one, it's one. If it's one or zero, it's one. But if you got both of one, it's zero. And uh, actually, when you combine uh, big networks, so when you stack them. All these neurons together, uh, it, it can learn uh, anything. <coughs> and there's different, um, there's thousands of different uh, people are researching this space, and um, so some are feedback, uh, feeding back into the network. Some have uh, this is pretty cool for audio because uh, you got this, uh, you feed different uh, time. Samples of different delays into the into the network. Uh, this is a um, kind of a memory to add memory to the network, so uh, you can remember things. Because otherwise, right, it's just there's no memory in that system. It's just you got inputs and outputs, but nothing gets stored. <coughs> so what's interesting, if you don't remove, if you don't have that uh, linear uh, non-linear function, that activation function. Uh, doesn't work, it doesn't learn anything because it's just a kind of a linear system. So you really need that non-linear function uh, to make uh, a neural network. And you know, in biology also, it, that it's also very non-linear in the brain. Right. Um, so as I said before, you if you're trying to classify audio, you uh, with shallow learning, you need to make your own features, and that te takes a lot of time. The idea with deep learning is uh, because you got this. Uh, so these are called hidden layers. 
uh, and the idea is that uh, you feed the raw data in, and these uh, these layers will actually uh, extract the features for you. And if you, for for example, for image recognition, the first uh, first stage, it will just recognize uh, like edges and straight edges and contrast things like that. And then you will kind of uh, combine this into detecting eyes and nose, and and then you will also combine that into detecting faces. And um, so you got you kind of increasing the at each layer, you're increasing the le level of uh, abstraction. And that's why now we can get really good uh, facial recognition. Uh, so what I've it's called convolution uh, neural network. It's used a lot in uh, um, for image recognition. Um, so, if you remember, like we were training the, our data parameters with the gradient descent. Well, here's the same. Uh, we train the the weights of the neurons. Also with uh, gradient, de uh, gradient descent, and finding that uh, lo that c lower c cost function. And so, as you're training your your system, this is the error, your the, the cost function, the error, the loss, fun sorry, loss function is reducing. Um, and at one stage, so this is on the training data, and this is on the tra uh, testing set. And you see that at one stage it will uh, the error will start increasing again, and that's you know that's when you go stop learning because you actually you that's when you start overfitting your the data. Uh, so there's different ways of avoiding over overfitting. One is just to stop learning at that uh, at that point. So you could be say you're there, okay, you're there, but you're not there. That's that's good enough. Uh, they got different. One is dropouts. Is actually you kill neurons. You make your system more simpler. Uh, re regularization is used a lot. It's, uh, you add uh, something in your uh, a term in your loss function that penalizes. Um, uh, if you got a really large weights, it will uh, make your uh, loss function higher. So you will the gradient descent will uh, avoid that. So some of the limits is uh, so the model is as good as the data. So it means uh, if you have poor data, then uh, it's not going to guess second guess the for you. Um, so really, you really need good data to to train and and test. Uh, can be very slow to uh, to train these systems. And it can take hours. And if you make a mistake, you have to, to start again. Uh, so it can be quite time consuming. Uh, it's quite opaque. So, uh, you, you don't know what's happening really in these hidden layers. Uh, it's quite a bit of a black box. Uh, it's not magical. It cannot learn uh, noise, for example. Noise is just noise. Um, so it cannot learn that. So it's not a cure-all uh, solution for every problem. Right, so now I'm going to switch, I'll give you a bit of a background on um, machine learning and just going to change context to more uh, audio uh, background. Um, so, hi. Right, you just heard that. Hi. Right. You just heard a female voice. Um, uh, you might guess the emotion. You might guess um, which country she's from. Very, you know, effortlessly. But a computer is only computer gets that. So uh, that's what we're up against with. Is um, we have to remember that a computer only <laughs> gets uh, zero and ones, and we have to be uh, patient. Um, so some of the 
application for uh, our machine listening. So one known applications are speech uh, recognition. Uh, actually, most of the speech recognition we now it's getting more into uh, neural networks, but for a very long time it just was uh, st uh, statistical models. And um, and actually, when you talk to Siri and uh, you know all these voice assistant, uh, actually they use a lot of the language. So natural language processing, which is uh, the, the the science of words uh, applied to machine learning, to correct. Actually, we don't hear very well, and uh, they have to correct a lot of the um, what you're saying. So that's why they get it really wrong at the moment. I think the best accuracy is 94% of uh, speech accuracy, and uh, they say when you they get to hoping to go to 99%. When you have 99% uh, accuracy for speech, then uh, things are getting, uh, you know, it's usable. I think now it's still uh, not entirely, uh, speech recognition is still not entirely uh, usable. Um, so another important area is uh, auditory scene analysis. So. Uh, for example, you could do a really cool hearing aid that uh, uh, picks up only the talking, right? It can recognize the barking and the siren <coughs> and only keep the, the signal of interest. Uh, this is also pretty hard. The brain is very good at this, at uh, separating the sounds in different streams. Um, it's quite hard for a machine to do, but this is where uh, AI can jumping. Uh, used a lot in also machine listening in fault analysis. So for example, in factories, they put um, more and more uh, microphones next to, say, a big machine. And it can pick up faults uh, like ball bearing, you know, which is about to, to break. Uh, it will pick up that fault before the fault actually happens. Uh, that's a it's quite good. Uh, I think it's a pretty exciting application. Uh, virtual sensing, some companies, uh, they, like for home, say you forgot to turn off the bath, it will, uh, or it will pick up if there's a broken uh, glass in your, in your house, it will uh, recognize the sounds and uh, alert you. Uh, of course, robots, you know, uh, it's good to have cameras, but also very good to have uh, ears. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think autonomous ve uh, vehicles as well can benefit. Um, so right now we're using LiDAR, which is kind of a laser uh, uh, radar. And, uh, but if you can um, pick up the sound as well, we are, okay, there's a big truck uh, at uh, six p uh, no, 3 o'clock, and uh, with microphone arrays, you can uh, localize sounds. I think it's a pretty cool application. Um, right, and uh, when uh, I brought this, so it's um, it's a little board that actually does a neural network. Uh, it's made uh, by Sparkfun and uh, actually Google, the partner together. And uh, what's pretty exciting is uh, it's running a uh, uh, TensorFlow, which is a uh, TensorFlow is a uh, it's kind of the library made by Google for uh, for neural networks, and uh, it's running on a tiny uh, microcontroller. And uh, so that thing does a kind of uh, 5 and 12 point FFT and a convolutional neural network, and can run on a battery for like uh, several weeks. Uh, so it's getting pretty exciting. Uh, so it only does one thing, it's just a uh, Keyword detection. So if you yes, yes, yeah, and there's a little light bulb flash. But so it's simple. Uh, it on, so. Did you train that? Uh, this is the the demo uh, <coughs> program. So yeah, I want to develop, improve it. I comp I compiled it. I know the only features being used just the FFT. Sorry. Are the only features being used? Yeah, so actually, yeah, it's uh, 
the way we we do that uh, keyword detection is uh, we do kind of a image recognition on the spectrogram. So, um, which I think is wrong. I mean, it's it works, but it's a hack because the brain doesn't do that right. It doesn't um, do a spectrogram and then do an image match. And actually, if you um, speak uh, just one meter away, because you get more reverb, it doesn't work anymore because uh, reverb kind of blends everything together, and then the Im the the detection doesn't work anymore. Welcome back. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's just a welcome back. Just dry and reverb. <coughs> Some other applications are uh, for denoising. So, classifier, you can classify is that speech or is it noise for each. So, you break up your signal into time and frequency. And then, each kind of little square, you say, is it noise or is it speech? If it's noise, you just throw it out. If it's uh, speech, you keep it. And then, you reconstruct your signal. Uh, I mean, it's a typical uh, no uh, denoising. Uh, Algorithm, but it's using uh, kind of deep learning now to, to do this. Um, this is a, also pretty cool. I've got a video on that. It's a sound source separation. So they also do image um, image base. I don't really like this image base uh, approaches to do uh, sound, but so they find a way of mapping uh, a mix into just the vocals. Uh, and I've got a video uh, before you will load. Yeah. It's the video. So they managed to separate just the So it's not coming out of the proper, sorry, oh. Anyway, you get the idea. Stop it now. <laughs> okay, one is, uh, so we talked about uh, uh, kind of more like listening, but you can also do synthesis. Uh, again, Google in 2016, they came up with a uh, WaveNet. Uh, pretty impressive. It's uh, so impressive that we didn't release. Usually they're pretty good at releasing uh, open source, but this one they kept it in-house. Uh, it's, they can try and you give it a bunch of uh, speech and it will uh, speech samples and it will um, find the, the mo it will model your voice and uh, it, it they compare it against the best kind of a spe uh, text to speech uh, synthesis and it kind of beat uh, this this was the state of the art and this is in terms of, this is a subjective uh, quality from zero to five. This is normal speech. Um, we've got some examples. A single wavenet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. Now, it's fast. So, it sounds a bit robotic, but I think it's... Uh, a single wavenet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. It now, like it's fast. fast at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so... And so the, after they tried, they trained the system, and then they said, "Okay, I'm not. I'm not. We're just giving you noise, no, no text. So, and it's just." The two to six now all spread good. Sure, I'll just see the sales guys. They're well and good. Yeah, as the hedging we've going to, it's always a pan. Sounds like Swedish, but uh, it's actually just gib gibberish. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
So, and then they, all, they, they can do any sound actually with music as well. So again, they give you lots of piano. And that's completely uh, composed out of, out of nothing. Uh, there's a company that does, it's called Lyrebird. You can do it online. You, you, you clone, uh, you record your own voice, and then you can do generate uh, text to speech with your own voice. Doesn't sound as good as the WaveNet, but it's, it's getting there. Uh, what is audio style transfer? So I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, audio style. Um, we can combine two images into the the style of a painting. Uh, I've got a model, but it's uh, it just sounds what you expect. It will just uh, blends two sounds. So one is so um, so. This is a tool. Um, it's called um, what is it called uh, Collab Collaboratory made by Google. Google. And actually, I discovered this uh, pretty recently. And uh, you, c you can run, uh, so it's running Python, and you can run, um, so it's running in the cloud, but you got a uh, GPU, so it's a uh, fast processing, uh, fast processing for uh, like for free, uh, because Google is are really pushing right now to, um, they give you all the tools, they give you this, which is free processing power, uh, they give you the data, they really uh, are very at the forefront of, uh, 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 machine learning and uh, AI at the moment. Um, even Facebook, they do like libraries like uh, Torch. Uh, Apple, not so much, but uh, Google, big time. Uh, so this is um, it's pretty cool because you can make your own models, and it's just a web page, and you can just send a link to someone, and it will they will have the program. But it's actually running a lot of uh, stuff in the cloud in the cloud. Um, this is, I believe, uh, they took like 20,000 huge library of uh, sounds of musical instruments. And what they can do is cr uh, to interpolate between any sounds of that library. Uh, so you can combine a clarinet with a guitar and like infinite combinations of, of sounds. Uh, so this is a kind of sweet every second. It's uh, randomly uh, interpolating to a different uh, instrument. So yeah, gives pretty uh, infinite um, possibilities with sound. A single wave net can capture the character. Okay. Um, so and for audio and supervised learning, you can uh, classify different styles of music. So for example, uh, for Spotify, it's good. Like if you want to, if you like that style of sound, you will play similar uh, types. Also good for if you got a really large library of sounds, it will uh, automatically uh, sort your sounds in different uh, areas, in different uh, buckets. Um, right, so um, this is a, a project that we started uh, recently, uh, and so it's having a go at that little board. Uh, and really, it's nice to be constrained uh, because you have to be careful on uh, so it, this is quite a constrained system because it's only uh, 96 megahertz and you only have like not much memory, uh, but you can still do, uh, it's got two microphones so you can still do uh, cool things on it. Um, so one of school of thought is uh, kind of the Google approach is uh, we have lots of data, really complex models and we don't do any feature engineering uh, and then they just uh, kind of brute force it. It might work well for a uh, big company like Google, but I prefer like a simpler approach where you're trying to uh, get inspiration from uh, the biology. 
uh, especially the auditory cortex. Uh, and then you combine that with deep learning. Uh, you connect all these little boxes, all these uh, little um, um, features with deep learning. Um, and the same as the super intelligence, wh what if we had like a super hearing uh, system like uh, you could think of uh, if you uh, push this really far, um, <coughs> you're not limited to two ears, you can have a microphone array, you can have ultrasonic range. Uh, so in theory, you could put uh, like a microphone inside the middle of a crowd and you'll be able to exactly pick up every conversation you'll be able to. Uh, in theory, it's possible because the information is there. Um, so I call this project audio cortex instead of auditory cortex. It's trying to uh, recreate some of the biology into uh, in with neural networks. Uh, and so the starting point is uh, looking at just pitch at the moment. So pitch is uh, is the main frequency of a uh, of the signal. Uh, and then uh, move on to um, uh, localization. Um, so the, the objective six system has very specialized uh, blocks. Uh, so one is just looking at the coherence between left and right. So if you're in a space with lots of reverb, the, the coherence will be low. Uh, and there's something that tracks that, that measure that correlation fact, uh, coefficient. Uh, sound localization, uh, it will pick up the delay and the amplitude difference between the ears. Again, there's a specialized uh, network that does that. There's a network that uh, break, uh, breaks up the, uh, the, s the sound into different frequency bands. Uh, and again, it's you, we go from uh, kind of low level features to uh, higher and higher levels of abstra abstraction. So once you got pitch, then you might be able to, tr to track uh, phonemes, then words, and then uh, I guess then language comes in and then you got meaning. Uh, so I believe it's possible to, uh, while staying humble, to uh, implement some of these blocks uh, one by one and then glue them together with uh, uh, kind of a, a deep learning uh, network. Right, so some of the tools now uh, for doing this. Really, if you want to double in, uh, uh, in machine learning at the moment, it's the best is to learn Python, because all the libraries are based on, on Python. Um, so there's really good libraries like scikit-learn, uh, TensorFlow, which is by Google, uh, Keras, Torch, uh, of course, MATLAB, Weka, which is from New Zealand, uh, as I showed, uh, Google Colab, which is at uh, free uh, uh, processing. Um, also, in terms of uh, you, you can build a, a rig at home. So you buy lots of graphics cards and a, p a big PC, and then uh, <laughs> you can make your own uh, rig for doing machine learning. It's pretty costly and kind of uses a lot of power. Or you can just rent, uh, yeah, like Amazon Cloud, uh, Google Cloud, you just rent uh, one hour of time where you try a new model, you test it, and that's it. So you pay like, say, $1 per hour. It's not much, but it adds up pretty quickly. And now uh, Google, they, got, they call this uh, TPU, uh, which is tensor, tensor Processing Unit. It's a little USB stick that you plug into your computer and it gives you a uh, machine learning uh, warmth for your PC. And I think now the next thing is, uh, is photonics. Uh, and um, there's a few company, uh, companies right now competing. Uh, Bill Gates have just invested like uh, huge money into one of his companies. And uh, so this is a, 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 t, um, a TPU. So usually when uh, you know a graphics card is, uh, it's very good at uh, multiplying a long array of numbers with just one uh, operation. Uh, because when you do graphics, you need uh, you do lots of ma matrix uh, maths multiplications, and they are the same maths as a, 
as uh, neural networks because all the weights of your system, you uh, you just process them in one go. And uh, so now Google are moving into the silicon and they're designing special specialized chips. Uh, and now it's getting into uh, I think the Nexus phone and even Apple is is getting onto it. So now designing special chips uh, to <coughs> implement these neural uh, model <coughs> neural networks. Uh, so it looks like that. It's um, actually looks a bit of a neural network. And so each of these blocks just do um, um, multiply accumulate. So it's just uh, a x a times x plus b. So it's quite simple. But it's got um, it's got its own memory as well. So instead of saving to memory, it it keeps the state in here. So it's very fast uh, register memory. And that's why they get really good performance. <coughs> but the next thing is uh, really is using, instead of um, uh, electricity, it's using uh, light. And so these companies now, uh, they claim you can, uh, with light, uh, you can go to 200 terahertz uh, with no heat and uh, low power. So imagine if you got, uh, instead of that little computer, but you got like a, almost like a supercomputer. So I think uh, AI will become everywhere. It will go everywhere in little objects, but they'll be really uh, uh, they they will be really smart objects, you know. Like uh, um, so, I think that's what's coming next, uh, and um, perhaps something with quantum computing. We hear a lot about it. Maybe also that will uh, bring us to that. Uh, Incredible um, uh, kind of superhuman uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, yeah. In conclusion, I think the the AI journey is out of the bottle. Uh, it's can't put it back in now, so we have to deal with it. We have to uh, work with it. I think it's pretty exciting times to be learning uh, ML and AI. Uh, personally, I've I've done like uh, signal processing and uh, machine learning for like uh, started four years ago. It's the natural progression. Like every project nowadays is always around machine learning. Uh, it seems the way it, uh, the natural progression of things. Um, I think audio engineering has a lot of benefits to benefit from uh, from this in terms of uh, machine listening and also synthesis. Uh, and I think it's pretty exciting because there's lots of resources uh, out there, uh, courses and uh, whole libraries, uh, almost is almost free, and uh, you get like, infinite knowledge. And uh, if you get the time, you can teach yourself uh, machine learning pretty well. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Those photonics computational units, are they a thing now? I haven't heard of them really. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're not, uh, uh, you can get uh, access to them through uh, like a data center, like a Google, um, like a cloud based instance. And now they're getting uh, this, as I showed, the, the this USB uh, <coughs> accelerators. Uh, yeah. So that's something you can buy in a shop? I've never heard of it. I think it's, it's, very, it's yeah. It's going to go mainstream pretty quickly. It's not mainstream yet, but yeah. Uh, yeah. You're thinking within five to ten years that'll be. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any particular companies who are promoting them? I think Google, big time. Yeah. Again. <laughs> They're moving into silicon now, are they? Yeah. Well, these the TPUs are. That's what it, it is now. Yeah. Because GPU is really is for graphics. It's a bit of a hack. It works, but. Uh, Graphics cards are for graphics, or uh, uh, so. The Bitcoin guys are buying up the replica. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, they, <laughs> you can do that as well. But, yeah. Is that another application of uh, machine learning? Uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, for example. I, I think it's in trading. Yeah, uh, people do trading, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it goes with uh, uh, cryptography. Probably. <laughs> Brute force stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I mean. It won't crack. Uh, it won't crack a password for you. Machine learning is not. Uh, it won't do that for you. Yeah. <laughs>
Yes. Do we really understand the auditory cortex, uh, cortex, and do we need to, or do we just throw silicon and optics at it? Uh, I think we do need to understand it. I think we're getting, uh, we learning, we are understanding small blocks of it. We don't make uh, when it gets to the higher levels of uh, hearing, it becomes a bit really fuzzy uh, because then it's you know blending with uh, human intelligence. Uh, but uh, up to a level, yes, I think uh, uh, we, there's definitely things that we can re implement in, in silicon up to a point. <laughs> Would you say that the um, one of the main skills of of um, uh, developing uh, a network for recognizing something um, a random thing uh, is, is that you've got to um, recognize the, uh, the use of each layer mm -hmm. and how to, how to divide the layer up or, or would you say that, that uh, machine learning can take care of that as well? To, uh, to do what? Sorry, to design the layers or to? Well, say for instance, if you, if you have one layer mm -hmm. Perception, you have to present it with pre processed data. The more layers you've got, uh, the more you can rely on the structure, the architecture of the machine to, to do that job of mm -hmm. compartmentalizing things. But if, for instance, you're unsupervised, um, how can you guarantee that you're going to get any useful outcome from it without imposing some sort of structure? Yeah, I think the you're talking about hyperparameters, right? Yeah. To, yeah, I think that's they're working on that. To uh, they want to have least amount of parameters as possible, uh, and uh, yeah, there's different ways like grid search and uh, random search, finding the right how many neurons, like what's uh, how you know what's the how the hyperparameters. Uh, I think. Yeah, you could use uh, a system that kind of self uh, <laughs> tune itself, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll maybe just supervise it, and rely on supervised. Yeah, you could. yeah, you could. Yeah, actually, uh, I've got an idea on uh, what I've talked about this um, uh, reinforcement learning. One one idea I'd like to try instead of playing video games is to uh, get the agents to. Uh, you give it like uh, filters and uh, operations and you tell the agent okay your reward is to make me a good feature that it can extract uh, discriminate sounds and it will uh, try to you know put a fire filter with something and uh, hopefully make uh, a, like a DSP <laughs> or like a feature like a whole system for you that's something I like to play with yeah. Uh, one of the first encounters I had with artificial intelligence was about 30 years ago and a book describing how to implement artificial intelligence on a certain popular 8-bit computer. Mm -hmm. But one of the key tenets then was that in an AI system, you had to have an audit path so that you could actually go back and check the, the, the way the decision was made. Well, it's is, not. Is that still a part of AI? No, no, that's the problem. It's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's a black box. Uh, it's too complex. It's too complex and uh, it's well, just abstract. The, yeah. the, the other vision of the future with robots, mm -hmm. your aim was to build a machine that could replicate itself. Mm -hmm. That was hardware, but in an AI system, are we now looking at the, the paradigm of having an artificial intelligence system that can design itself other artificial intelligence? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Are the tools to do this? Um, yeah, I know there's work in that, in that space. Uh, I'm not, yeah, the best person to talk about it, but uh, yeah. Um, I remember they, they took two AIs to talk to each other, and they came up with new language. To uh, they created language to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, I think it's all fascinating uh, 
aspects. Uh, I think also AI. This already started with this big network, but what uh, you know, when we are born, we're just a couple of cells, right? Uh, so I like uh, to see a network that kind of s self growing from very simple to getting more and more complex. Uh, I think it's all anything is possible. You know, it's a very uh, <laughs> Exciting space, but uh, self, yeah, self uh, improving AI. I think is, um, yeah, I think is. is uh, I could came through engineering when the, the it was the start of the integrated circuit industry. You were moving from a discrete system over where you had control over everything. Yeah, and then you went to these circuit blocks that were actually decided on. And form is decided on by the makers of the integrated <coughs> circuit. Mm -hmm. And so your discretion and ability to make the system depended on selecting the, the IC system or integrated system that could do what you closest you could do want to do. And you had to learn the art of putting those together mm -hmm. efficiently rather than making the system right. totally in your own image. Yeah. And it seems that they're. they're must be a hierarchy now in artificial intelligence where they are the makers of the building block exactly, to yeah. decide what to put in there and the people who apply it yep. by taking <coughs> what, what they can and putting it together in a way. Is, is this the way that... Oh, you're absolutely you know, right, yes. Uh, is, is, is definitely, especially with uh, libraries uh, like mm -hmm. TensorFlow. You can create a pretty complex network in like 20 lines of code, right? And uh, each line of code is actually, if you go deeper, it's actually, you know, could be thousands of neurons firing and different weights. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's getting more uh, easier to access because you're really putting blocks together. It can be also a trap because sometimes you don't know, if you don't know enough about the theory behind it. Then it's a black box. Yeah, it's a black box. Yeah. But you could also say that, that um, one of the, the things cited about uh, deep learning is that um, it, it's brought together a, a, a plethora of different um, uh, 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 skills. So people who, who are working on vision, mm. people working on on um, on um, other, um, on the markets and or sound or whatever, they all couldn't collaborate. Yeah. They spoke different languages, but now they speak in the same language, so they can research and share ideas, and, and that's something we've never had before with new ones. Yes, and I think audio is very uh, under, uh, it's kind of the poor child of <laughs> AI. I think uh, because everything is vision and image recognition, and uh, we really want to push the audio for uh, machine learning because it, I think it's still uh, undervalued and um, there's m maybe like if you got 100 uh, people working on uh, vision, uh, image recognition, you got like five working on audio, you know, it's very uh, underdeveloped right now. Yeah. So what would you say the top three or five um, audio applications currently using this technology commercially? Uh, well, I think a big thing is uh, speech, really. Uh, speech. Uh, in all the music, like, uh, are all the music outlets using this for classifying genres? Or yeah, well, I think it's 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 nice, but it's not a you know it's not big um, big business. Uh, speech is big business because most likely that's when we're going to interact with uh, machines uh, a lot more. No screens, just uh, speaking to them. Um, uh, yeah, so I think the more like being used in, uh, in mastering. Like the final step for you could, but this mattering is so arty that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a website. There's a company called Lander. Like you upload a song and you will figure out the genre of the song and master the song accordingly. Okay. And all the mastering engineers are a bit scared of that because mm. it's so, like mixing is way more complex, but mastering in theory is what they're doing. Mm. It actually sounds pretty impressive. Okay. When you, go and upload, you can upload a song for free. I think they're actually using your song. Mm. Train your own yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. Give you a few for free. Yeah. And then after a while, you have to pay yourself. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I imagine there'll be a lot of money in recordings, mm. making recordings, bespoke recordings, as examples. 
samples and then so mm -hmm. much of, uh, of uh, audio samples needed in the future or mm. whatever. So someone might make money out of that. Yeah. I think yeah, maybe hearing aids as well. Would like hearing aids would can really benefit from from the, from I machine learning. I noticed that um, I get a lot of scam calls. I'm in that age group where that happens a lot. Mm. And lately, I've been getting a scam call that sort of sits there and waits for me to respond. And if I don't respond in a certain time, then mm. the scam call kicks in and I re report them. Uh, but if I say something, almost anything, hello, how are you? Who's there? Um, it hangs up. Sometimes mm. it says goodbye. It just hangs up. I wonder if they're actually using this sort of voice recognition to recognise my voice, the fact that I do record, mm. and eliminating me from their data, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, after. <laughs> there's this. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. It's like a. It's not really machine learning, but it's something that talks back to the these scam companies using pre-recorded uh, sentences and it, it's like this hilarious YouTube videos and you got the guy on the call center like waste like half an hour and just goes on in circle. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> I think AI to talk back to these guys would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, there's been a bit said, uh, said about the demise of creativity in music, and, like in recent times where there's a lot of artists that rely on sampling and creating works of art um, from um, sample libraries and the like. Mm. Do you see AI going in and completely creating compositions yeah. um, for mm. mass distribution based on you know where we are now? Uh, or what's gone before us. That's interesting. Um, is, yeah. is there anything being done in, in, in that area? I've got some, yeah, examples of music composition uh, where, yeah, you compose, you give it like, um, you know, hundreds of uh, classical music and it will, yeah, it will make okay. sound, but is it creativity? Is it, yeah. it sounds like, but to me it's, it's not cr really People creativity. Saying, well, yeah. What's happened to what's happened to the great bands, of, you know, the seventies and the eighties, the classic rock bands, mm. the Led Zeppelins and the like, where you know truly game changing and yeah. and, and uh, completely created uh, from scratch music, uh, as opposed to now where we're getting a lot. There's really a lot of it is mainstream and, and built on the formula. George um, Martin doesn't do your own. It is. Where where are we headed? Or it's even worse than that because I had heard, heard in a podcast that they're going to have like songs and songs on Spotify generated by algorithms based on you. Wow. Well, I'm not sure if that's something. That sounds, like. pretty, sounds pretty boring. Yeah. 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 But there, there are already. Like, okay. Even YouTube channels streaming stuff like that just for really fantastic. Mm. Yeah, I think it's the. It's just, it's just preventing people from actually learning the instruments and trying to play the songs. This is far too because I, I, I mm. like, play a lot and there's a lot of gadgets for trying to play, following the ball or remove the guitar from the song. But the guys in the 1970s didn't have any of that. Mm. Just listen to the great, great albums and just learn how yeah. to play. So I think in a way, you got to be careful with these things. Maybe in place yeah, it's, I don't think it's a good application of... Uh, yeah, <laughs> the ability of, that we have to learn, right? Because mm. I think human creativity is... Irreplaceable, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we we'll to make sure we keep that. Uh. More questions? That was excellent. Most informative. Thank you. We have a small gift. Oh, for thanks you, very much. Or whoever you'd like to share it with. Yes, thanks. For sir. coming along tonight. Cheers, thanks. And I think we've all found a lot from that. And I've got a lot of questions, but I don't think I can answer them. I'd like you all to thank you for coming along tonight.